Welcome to part six, where we'll be looking at ways to apply item response theory in various measurement contexts, or perhaps even to work it into your dinner conversation. There are many item response theory applications, but in this module, I'm just going to concentrate on three of them. First, using an item response theory model to select a scale or to develop a scale. Using IRT to create a common metric so that the scores of two different scales that measure the same or similar constructs can be associated with each other. And then finally, using item response theory in the context of computer adaptive testing. You've seen a picture like this before. It's an information func function, but it's not an item information function. It's a scale information function. It shows the information you would get if you summed across the information of all the item items in a scale. It's also different in that it has androgynous blue humanoids to illustrate levels of pain impact. The scale information function is very handy because it helps you identify areas of the measurement continuum where a scale is measuring well and also where it's not measuring very well at all. As you can see, it's all in the pictures. Low information may not be a problem if it's in an area of the measurement continuum where you have no interest. For instance, you might not be that interested in measuring people whose pain is not clinically relevant. What you want is to find a scale or develop a scale that has good information in the range of the trait that is of interest to you. Now let's return to a picture of item information. On this plot, the item information of two different items is shown. The information plot that's in blue there shows an item that provides a good bit of information at low levels of pain impact. The pink one provides good information at high levels of pain impact. Plots like this can be a lot of help to you when you're developing a scale. So now moving from scale development and scale evaluation, I want to briefly mention another application of item response theory, and it's called scale alignment. Suppose that you want to compare the results of two studies, but unfortunately the two studies use two different scales to measure pain. Because the scores are on different metrics, it can be hard to compare the study results. An alternative that you have that IRT gives you is to align the scales to a common mathematical metric. The details of how this can be done are beyond the scope of this module, but I did want to mention that IRT offers some elegant methods for aligning the scores of two measures of the same construct. Once the scale alignment is completed, then you can have a crosswalk that is basically a table that shows you what scores on one measure are associated with the scores on another measure. The third application of item response theory that I want to talk about is computer adaptive testing. Computer adaptive testing goes by its initials, so it's called CAT. You could say that item response theory is the math behind the CAT, and it's also which what gives me an excuse to use this great graphic. Computer adaptive testing starts with a bank of items. A bank of items is a collection of items that covers the entire range of the trait that you're interested in measuring. And all the items of the bank are calibrated to an item response theory model. That is, all the items have been modeled using IRT's probability equations. So if it's a Roche model that's being used, all the item difficulties have been estimated. If a two-parameter model is being used, both the difficulties and the discrimination of all the items have been modeled. Let's use an easy example to explain how a cat works. Imagine that you want to measure physical function. There's a whole range of physical function from very low physical function to being at a high level athlete level. And you can picture a lot of different items that you could write that would target physical function. This is your item bank. What an IRT calibration does is order these items along the continuum from very low function to very high function. Once you have your items all calibrated, the cat can go to work. It starts by identifying the first item to administer to the respondent. Now, if you don't know anything about your respondent, then the best guess you could make is that he or she has a medium level of physical function. So the CAT algorithm goes, identifies an item that has a medium difficulty, and administers this first item to our respondent. But what if our respondent is a high-level athlete? In that case, she will answer this item in a way that indicates that she has higher than average function. So when the CAT algorithm goes in search of a second item to administer, it will take this into account and go pick out an item with higher difficulty. 
This process continues as the CAT algorithm narrows in on ever more precise estimate of the person's trait level. So a new item is administered, and then based on the person's response to that item, the CAT updates its estimate of the respondent's trait level. Then based on that updated estimate, the CAT goes and identifies the best next item to administer, the item that has the most information for that trait level. But let's say that our respondent is not a high-level athlete, but is someone with very low physical function. In that case, he's going to respond to that first item in a way that indicates that he is lower than average physical function. The CAT algorithm takes this into account and goes and finds an easier item. This item is administered, and the process continues just as before. After every response, the CAT's estimate of trait level is updated. And then based on the updated estimate, a new best item is picked. Notice what is accomplished here. The CAT has administered items that are tailored to the respondent. So hard items aren't given to the person with poor physical function, and easy items aren't given to people with excellent function. And even though these two respondents get different items, the IRT model is able to line them up on the same mathematical metric. After only a couple of items have been administered, the standard error of the CAT's estimate of the person's level of trait is pretty wide. After another item is administered, the standard error gets smaller. As more items are administered, the algorithm closes in on a reliable estimate of the person's trait level and the standard error tightens up. With a polytomous scale, after six or seven items, you often have a lot of information about the person's trait, trait level. That is, you have a very reliable estimate, one that has a very small standard error of measurement. The CAT algorithm continues until either A, a specified number of items have been administered. For instance, you might tell the CAT to administer seven items to everyone. Or B, the CAT algorithm can be program to continue until a specified standard error is reached, or you can use some combination of the two. The rules that tell the cat when to stop are aptly named. They're called stopping rules. This is a rare example of accessible psychometric terminology. When you think about it, testing someone or assessing someone using cat is a lot of trouble. It requires specialized software, it requires technical expertise, so it's fair to ask this question, why bother with it? Well, if you think of measurement efficiency as the precision that you get relative to the, to the number of items that are administered, the CAT algorithm maximizes this efficiency. That means the burden of responding to items is lessened. So you get less burden from one assessment, and that also makes room for measuring more domains. There's increasing realization of just how many psychosocial domains influence health outcomes. If you want to measure several of these, then it's important that you do so with as much efficiency as you can muster. So that's it for this module. Uh, congratulations on making it all the way through. I encourage you to loop back through some or all of the modules again. Psychometrics is one of those things that takes a few passes at before it sinks in. Let me hear from you. I'd like to learn from your experience viewing this module, uh, so don't be a stranger. Let me know. <laughs>